2019 NAEP report confirmed that, with few exceptions, over the past decade, state reading scores have flatlined. Much of this has been connected to the well-documented and now much discussed gap between the science of reading and the practice of reading. So today we're going to be exploring and discussing that gap and what underlies it. And to begin that conversation, I'm incredibly honored to introduce our moderator for today, Monroe Richardson. Monroe is the Executive Director of Read Charlotte. That's the grade level reading community initiative in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he's bringing his 20 plus years of experience to bear in that role as he engages families, educators, and community partners in using research, data, and strategic funding to coordinate, integrate, and align local efforts to improve children's language and literacy development from birth through third grade. So welcome, Monroe, and thank you so much for your leadership and pulling together today's conversation. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to all of you that have joined us today. Um, we're, I'm incredibly excited about today's panel. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a while, and really um, the uh, importance of today's topic, the, the focus on uh, science of reading, is really important to us here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we are really uh, focused on how do we use research data and evidence-based practices to inform the work and, and to help give thousands of children more of a fair opportunity to be able to read well by the end of third grade. All of us um, on this webinar today know how incredibly important this is. And this topic is very timely and I'm so excited to have the um, three um, panelists today. Um, first off, we've got um, Emily Hanford, who is a senior correspondent and producer for APM Reports, uh, which is the documentary and investigative journalism group at American Public Media. Uh, Emily's been covering education for more than a decade, and for the last three years, has spent the majority of our time reporting on early reading instruction her 2018 podcast and article, Hard World Words, Why Aren't Kids Being Taught to Read, um, really created ripples across the um, US education landscape and has elevated the importance of teacher knowledge about the science of reading. So um, excited to have Emily. Um, we're also excited to have Andy Rotherham join us. Uh, Andy is a co-founder and partner at Bellwether Education Partners, a national nonprofit organization that works to support educational innovation and improve outcomes for underserved students. Um, he's also a contributing edit editor to US News and World Report and a senior editor at The 74, an education news and analyst publication. I first knew of Andy years ago um, from his blog, Eduant, which I'm sure a number of us um, follow. And then last, but certainly not least, I'm really excited to have uh, Jenny McKenzie here with us. She is an Emmy winning documentary filmmaker whose mission is to produce films that promote social change. Um, her films on a variety of topics have aired on um, top channels such as HBO, Hulu, PBS, and Amazon. Um, these social impact documentaries have been screened at international film festivals and are currently being used by the US State Department to discuss public health and social justice issues around the globe. So really excited to have um, all three of these panelists with us today and to be able to hear from them. So um, um, first, I'd like to start with uh, Emily. Um, so um, Emily, um, I, uh, a lot of us have followed um, your, your reporting and I understand that um, you have done a lot of reporting on post-secondary and secondary education. Um, so I'm really curious what led to your interest in early reading instruction? Hello, thank you so much for having me today. Um, yes, it's true. I, I've been a reporter for a long time and I've been covering education for a close, about 12 years now, actually. And um, I really knew nothing about this topic of early reading instruction just a few years ago. And um, as you said, I've spent the majority of my time for the last three years. These are the three um, podcasts that I've done in the last three years. And, and I, I got into this I was actually uh, interested in college students with learning disabilities, which quickly led me to wanting to know more about dyslexia, since reading is by far the most common issue when students are having learning issues in, in school. 
And I ended up talking to families all over the country and I heard the same story over and over again, like the, the exact same story, <laughs> like the same lines and the same places in the story where they break down in tears because they all break down in tears. And the story basically goes like this. My kids started school and I knew something wasn't right. And I went to the teacher and she said, you know, don't worry, uh, be sure to read lots of books uh, to your child and everything will be fine. Uh, but reading was really hard for my child. He just didn't seem to get it. And so I went to the first grade teacher and she said, don't worry, all kids learn differently. It'll all come together in time. And it basically went on and on like this, like year after year, the parents saying something's really not right here. And the school pretty much saying everything's fine. And the parent not really knowing what to do because you know, the schools are the education experts, right? And so sometimes at this point, the mom, the parents are thinking like, maybe my child has dyslexia. But when she brings dyslexia up with the school, they tell her, no, no, we don't say that here. We don't use the word dyslexia. And maybe her child gets pulled out of the classroom for some extra help, or maybe get some kind of accommodations like extra time on tests or you know, maybe audiobooks or something if he's lucky. But the kid really still doesn't learn how to read because he's not really taught how to do it because this is what my reporting has found, the school does not, for the most part, actually know that much about how skilled reading develops. And that means that the school doesn't really know what's going on when a child is struggling to read. And at the end of the day, they don't necessarily know what to really do about it. And here's what happens with that worried mom who has the struggling reader, if she has the time, and especially if she has the money. She takes things into her own hands, she pays for private testing, which can cost thousands of dollars. She might pay for private tutoring, which can be many more thousands of dollars. She might hire like an educational consultant or a lawyer or both to help her fight for what her kid needs uh, in public school. And all of this isn't just expensive. It's really, really hard. It's exhausting. It's frustrating. And the mother begins to realize that her kid may never get what he needs in public school or he's not really going to get it fast enough because now he's like eight or nine or 10 years old and he really doesn't like school. And he's behind in other subjects because he can't read well enough. And he might be like acting out in school or maybe it's all manifesting as like depression and anxiety and withdrawal. And maybe her kid who's like nine or 10 years old has actually said to her, I want to kill myself, which is, this is something that I have heard from a shocking number of parents. They have little kids who say they want to die because they can't read. And this is when, if this mom has the resources, she pulls her kid out of public school. Maybe she homeschools him. I've talked to a number of parents who've done homeschooling. Maybe the family figures out a way to come up with the tens of thousands of dollars that it can cost to send a child to a specialized private school if there is a specialized private school nearby. That's a big if. At one point, I was with a group of moms in a dyslexia advocacy group here in Maryland, where I live, and I realized that none of them, not a single one of them, had their struggling readers in public school anymore. They had all given up on the idea that public school was going to help their kids learn how to read. And that really is like the situation that we're in in this country. If you can come up with the money to pay for it, you can probably find a way for your struggling reader to be taught how to read. But if you don't have the money and your child is not learning to read in school, what do you do? And you know, the equity implications of this are stunning, truly. If you're not from, a, if you're from like a low or even a moderate income family, there's like no safety net. There's no backup if you're not being taught to read in school. One mom said to me early on, she said, getting help for a struggling reader is a rich man's game. And that just really, I mean, that's reading. It's like the most basic fundamental skill. It's like the foundation upon which academic learning is built and it's a rich man's game. So, you know, how did this happen? How is it allowed to continue? That's really how I got interested in this topic of early reading instruction. Wow, that's uh, incredibly powerful. And you know, I, I've heard similar stories from, from mothers here in Charlotte who, you know, similarly were frustrated and um, had to work hard to advocate for their children. Um, and a lot of these parents feel crazy. <laughs> they feel like, I think something's wrong and the school's saying everything is fine. Right. And it just can be so hard to get people to listen to you. But I think at the end of the day, it's because really a lot of times the school just doesn't know what to do about it. Yeah. So as you dug into this topic, um, I'm curious, what did you uncover about the science of reading? Um, what are some of the basics of that science? And what does it tell all of us about how we should teach children to learn to read? 
Yeah, so that phrase, the science of reading, gets tossed around a lot these days. Um, so I want to talk about that first. Like, here's a, here's a definition. Like, what do we mean by that? What is the science of reading? So this is from Mark Seidenberg. He's a cognitive scientist who's been studying this topic for a long time, as have many scientists. He's been studying this since the 1970s. So this is his definition of the science of reading. Uh, I'll just read it. Everyone can read it. But the science of reading is a body of basic research in developmental psychology, educational psychology, cognitive science, and cognitive neuroscience on reading, one of the most complex human behaviors, and it's biological, it's neural, it's genetic bases. This research has been conducted for decades in the United States and around the world. The research has important implications for helping children to succeed, but it has not been incorporated in how teachers are trained for the job or how children are taught. So that's from Mark Seidenberg, who's written a, an extraordinary book, which was really sort of my gateway drug into this whole thing called Language at the Speed of Sight. And I recommend that book. So, so you know, what does the science say? Obviously, we have limited time here today, so I'm not going to be able to talk about everything that I've learned. But I think a really good place to begin is with something called the simple view of reading, which many people uh, listening may know. Um, it's, it's basically a model uh, that was first proposed a really long time ago when I was still in high school, 1986, by reading researchers Philip Goff and William Tunmer. And they, they were really, they proposed this model because there was a lot of fighting going on at the time about reading. We were, this was like the reading wars, 1980s. So they were trying to clarify the role of decoding in reading comprehension, because that's what was being fought about, sort of phonics, reading comprehension. So the simple view basically says, this is this formula, that reading comprehension is the product of two things. So one, it's your ability to decode words. So you see a string of letters like R-E-A-D-I-N-G, and you know that that string of letters represents the word reading. The other part of the equation is your language comprehension. So that's your ability to understand spoken language. So we're not talking about your ability to read text Language comprehension is your ability to understand meaning when someone is talking to you or when text is being read out loud to you. So for example, when someone says to you, she's reading the book, you know what the verb means in that sentence, you know what she's doing. So the simple view of reading says that if you have really good language comprehension, but zero decoding skills, your reading comprehension will be zero because it's an equation here because zero times anything is zero, right? And the simple view also says that if you have really good decoding skills, but you have very poor language comprehension, you just don't know the meaning of that many words in spoken language, your reading comprehension is not going to be very good either. So what's really interesting is to look at how this applies to learning how to read. So most kids who are entering school, they have very little when it comes to the decoding part of the equation. They have zero or close to zero when it comes to the D in the simple view of reading, right? Some kids have more, more than others, but they do. All kids coming into school have something when it comes to language comprehension part of the equation. In other words, when children enter school, they know the meaning of lots of words actually, but they don't know how to decode those words yet. They don't know what they are in print. So this is why people who are familiar with the science of reading call for an emphasis, not an only, but an emphasis on decoding instruction, decoding instruction, phonics instruction, in the early grades at the beginning of reading instruction because if the goal is to get to reading comprehension and you have a bunch of five and six-year-olds before you who have language comprehension skills but virtually no decoding skills what do you need to do to help those children get to reading comprehension which everyone says is the goal you need to help those children develop decoding skills what you want to focus on with beginning readers is getting their decoding skills up to their level of language comprehension now, the simple view of reading clearly shows that focusing only on decoding would be a very big mistake because it's only half the equation. And as everyone knows, kids come into school with very different language comprehension skills. Some kids know the meaning of lots and lots of words. And some kids have far, far smaller vocabularies. So reading instruction that aligns with the science of reading, that aligns specifically with the simple view of reading, it has to focus on the language comprehension part of the equation too. So this means lessons and activities and things that expand children's oral vocabularies. So I was in a first grade classroom in Oakland, California last year, where I would say reading instruction was well aligned with the simple view of reading. The teacher in that class knows the simple view of reading and understands what it says. What I saw 
was explicit phonics instruction in one part of the reading instruction. So kids were actually broken into small groups depending on the level of their decoding skills because kids are at different levels with this. And then another part of the reading instruction was like explicit vocabulary lessons and lots of reading aloud by the teacher and having the kids talk. And the words the kids had learned in this part of their lessons were posted on cards all over the classrooms. And they included words like gigantic, extraordinary, ridiculous, and neighborly. So those are not words that the vast majority of first graders are going to be able to decode and they shouldn't be able to, you know, be expected to decode words like that. But the first graders in this class in California, they were learning the pronunciation and the meaning of these words so that when they're able to read them, they will know what the words mean, which is really, really important for reading comprehension. By the way, in this classroom in California, every single child in the class spoke a language other than English at home. In fact, many of the kids spoke English as their third language. And they were learning just an incredible amount of vocabulary in this class. The simple view of reading was proposed, like I said, a long time ago. It was a theoretical model back in 1986. And the basics of this model have been confirmed over and over again since. In fact, there's a really fascinating book that's being published in just a few months that I got an advanced copy of that's all about the research that's gone into the simple view of reading over the years and how it uh, relates to the teaching of reading. So it's really, really helpful. This equation is really helpful. It doesn't say that reading is simple. It simply says that reading can be broken into these two distinct pieces. And it's a way of understanding what is going on when skilled reading occurs and also what's going on when kids are struggling with reading. So it disentangles a lot of this stuff that has been really, really contentious and I would say continues to be in the debates about reading. So what's known as the whole language view and more recently the balanced literacy view of reading instruction. The focus right from the beginning is supposed to be on getting kids to focus on the meaning of what they're reading because that's the goal. But the idea is to get kids focused on meaning right away. So whole language and balanced literacy are sort of meaning emphasis approaches to reading instruction as opposed to what's known as a code emphasis approach which emphasizes decoding skills at the beginning of reading instruction. Doesn't only do that, but it emphasizes that. So early reading instruction that aligns with this big body of scientific research is basically a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meaning. And everyone agrees that meaning is the goal, but the question really is how does a little kid get there? That is um, really incredible. Um, what you, uh, what you learned and what you discovered um, in, in your reporting. Um, so I'm curious, um, so understanding what the science tells us, right, about how children learn to read, what have you found now in terms of how we're actually teaching children to read in many of the classrooms around the country? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by talking a little bit about phonics, because that's what we fight a lot about. And we have actually been fighting about it for centuries, like hundreds of years in this country. Fights about phonics go back way, way back. Um, and the basic debate boils down to, should reading instruction begin by teaching children explicitly how the sounds and words are represented by letters? Or is that a bad idea? Will focusing on letters and sounds distract kids from the meaning of what they're reading? and actually get in the way of what's most important, which is encouraging a love of reading and a love of literature. So that fight, those fights, are ostensibly over now. So many literacy experts and curriculum developers who, who did once dismiss or very much minimize the importance of teaching children how the sounds and words are represented by letters, many of those people are now embracing phonics. They're even selling phonics programs. And schools that had no phonics instruction or just kind of a dusting of it here and there, or really who knows, because it was up to the individual teacher, which it still is to sort of figure out how to do this. Many of those schools have started adding a phonics block, 20 or 30 minutes a day uh, it, of explicit phonics instruction in their literacy instruction. And that seems great. But many of those schools, I would argue, are still not teaching reading in ways that line up with what decades of scientific research show about how reading skill develops. And how do I know that? Because while more and more schools may be adding a phonics block, what I also see in schools are things like this. So this is, this, these are word reading strategies that you will find in schools all over the country. 
they, there's many different versions of it, but it's basically this series of little characters with these, these strategies for reading words. I've seen these things on posters in classrooms, on bookmarks that get sent home with kids. They're all over Pinterest and teachers pay teachers. I've also seen things like this. So what parents can say to readers. These are all strategies for children to use when they're reading and they come to a word they don't know. And these strategies seem sensible enough. You get to a word you don't know, what can you do? Well, you can look at the picture to try to figure out what the word might be. You don't wanna completely guess. So you can look at the first letter. You can look at how the word begins. That's gonna narrow your choices. You can then check to see if you're right. You can reread the sentence using the word and see if the sentence makes sense. And if you're stuck, you can just skip the word and move on and hopefully you can get the gist of the sentence anyway. Again, these strategies seem sensible enough. Let's give kids some tools for when they come to words they don't know. But the question that I really started to ask as a reporter is what's the theory of how reading works that these strategies are based on? Like what is the idea about how kids learn to read and how they learn to read words in particular. So these strategies are rooted in a theory about reading that came to be known as three cueing. And this is a diagram that many of you have probably seen before. This basic idea or, uh, was originally proposed back in the 1960s. And the idea is that, this is actually an idea of how skilled reading works. The idea is that as people read, they make predictions about the words on the page using three different kinds of information or cues. So they use the graphic cues, like what do the letters tell you about what the word might be? Use syntactic cues, like what kind of a word could it be? For example, is it a noun or a verb or an adjective? And you use semantic cues, like what word would make sense here based on the context? And when this idea was proposed, it was, it was kind of a new twist on sort of prevailing ideas about how reading works. And it went on to become the theory of word reading that provided a foundation for the whole language approach to teaching reading. Many teachers know this cueing theory today. They, they maybe have never heard of cueing and three cueing systems, but they often know this thing called MSV. So M is for using meaning to figure out what a word is. S is for using the sentence structure or the syntax. And V is for using the visual information like the letters in the word. And you're gonna find this MSV idea in lots of popular curriculum materials and assessment materials, including materials developed by Irene Fountas and Gay Sue Pinnell and by Lucy Calkins. And people in education tend to know who those people are. Fountas and Pinnell, they are very well known for an approach to reading instruction that's known as guided reading and for a widely used uh, reading assessment system that uses what's known as leveled books. Uh, Fountas and Pinnell also sell a reading intervention program called Leveled Literacy Intervention, or LLI. Education Week did a survey back in the fall, and 43% of K-2 through teachers reported using LLI, which is an extraordinarily high number. Lucy Calkins is a professor at Teachers College Columbia, and she's the creator of something called the Units of Study for Teaching Reading series. She does a Units of Study for Teaching Writing also. But her stuff is sort of more commonly known as reader's workshop, reading workshop. And according to the Ed Week survey that I just mentioned, 16% of teachers report using units of study to teach reading. So that actually makes it the third or a kind of tied for the second most widely used set of materials to teach reading in the United States of America. You will find some phonics in the Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell approaches. In fact, Lucy, Conics, uh, Lucy Calkins now sells a units of study for teaching phonics program. And Fountas and Pinnell have developed specific books and materials to teach phonics too. And if you look back at older editions of their books and materials, you will find some phonics, especially in Fountas and Pinnell. But phonics is typically, it's presented as one way to know what a word is. It's like one strategy. It's that third cue in the three cueing system I was talking about. So what I found in my reporting, what I, what I think schools need to know is that when they are buying materials from Calkins and Fountas and Pinnell and others, the, these, these, these strategies are in other materials too. These just happen to be some materials that are very widely used. But when you buy materials that have this MSV idea in it, they're bu you're buying an approach to teaching reading that's rooted in this particular theory about how reading works. And it's like this idea that skilled readers use meaning and context to identify words as they read. So what you're likely to find in a whole lot of American classrooms today is like 20 or 30 minutes of a phonics program of some kind, and then reader's workshop or guided reading where kids are taught that when they come to a word they don't know, 
they can sound it out. They can sound it out and use what they've learned in their phonics lessons for sure. But they also have all these other strategies. They can think about a word that makes sense. They can look at the first letter of the word or they can just skip the word altogether. And the question really is like, what's wrong with that? I mean, why not teach kids lots of strategies to help them when they come to a word they don't know? Like I said, it seems like a good idea, but it comes back to the decades of scientific research on reading. This huge body of evidence that has uncovered what skilled reading is and how people do it. And one of the key things that reading scientists have figured out is that skilled readers do not use context and cues to read words. In fact, what scientists have discovered is that this is how poor readers read. Poor readers, struggling readers, tend to have a hard time with word identification. Too many of the words they come across are like little mysteries, series of letters that they don't know right away, and they often can't quite figure out. So they use a bunch of other strategies to try to understand what the words say. They memorize as many words as they can. They, uh, when they come to a word they don't know, they look at the first letter, the first few letters, they try to think of a word that makes sense. In other words, they use context to try to come up with a word that fits. And when they can't figure out what a word is using context clues, they skip the word. I've talked to many adult struggling readers who have described this process to me. This is how they do it. And often they can get a gist of what they're reading this way. They can get a gist of it, especially if they're reading something that they have some knowledge about. They actually have come across those words a lot of time before. They have some good background knowledge. You can kind of get through text. But using context, guessing, skipping words, this is not what reading is like when you are a skilled reader. What cognitive scientists have figured out is that the key difference between skilled readers and unskilled readers is that skilled readers can immediately and accurately recognize words. They don't need to guess or use context or predict. Skilled readers actually know tens of thousands of words instantly on sight. In fact, when you're a skilled reader, your brain, you're actually not born with a brain that's wired to read, but you can get so good at it, your brain can get so good at reading words that you process the word book faster than you process a picture of a book. And so the question really is, how did your brain get so good at that? And it happens to this process called orthographic mapping, which I don't have time to describe today, but it's completely fascinating. And I encourage you to read more about it. You can Google it. I tried my best to explain it in this um, podcast, an article called At a Loss for Words, which came out uh, last August. You can go to the next slide. The, the critical takeaway from all of this, just to boil it down though, is that skilled word reading, that half of the equation we were talking about before, that when you could get good at that, skilled word reading is really like a reflex. It's not a detective game. It's not contextual guessing. It's not a series of strategic actions, which is the way that it gets described in a lot of curriculum materials. Skilled word reading is automatic and effortless. And by about second grade, a typically developing reader who has acquired a good understanding and that often means being taught how to do this, a good understanding of how the sounds and words are represented by letters and how English spelling works, that kid by about second grade needs just a few exposures to a word through the pronunciation of the word, the spelling of the word, the orthographic form of it, and the meaning of the word. You would need an exposure through those three things, the pronunciation, the spelling, and the meaning, and bam, that word gets mapped into your memory, orthographically mapped into your memory. And the more words that a reader maps to memory like this, the more the reader can focus on the meaning of what they're reading. Because they're not using brain power to identify words, you're using your brain power to understand what you're reading. What you're reading. And everyone, everyone, everyone agrees that this is the point for readers to comprehend what they're reading. But debates about reading have ended up for decades stuck in this argument about whether teachers should focus on helping kids learn to read words or whether they should focus on reading comprehension. And that debate really makes no sense because how can you truly comprehend what you're reading if you can't accurately read the words? And reading comprehension is really the accumulation of knowing how to decode the words and knowing what a lot of words mean and having really good knowledge at your, at your, um, that you can call on. So as I said before, just to wrap up, you know, a lot of kids are being taught some kind of phonics, some kind of decoding in school. And the problem though is that they are often being taught all this cueing stuff too. 
And some children can overcome this contradiction and they overcome it quite easily. They figure out kind of quickly that sounding out a word, understanding its spelling is the most efficient way to know what that word is. Now those kids tend to have pretty good phonological skills, like understanding how sounds and letters work comes pretty easily to them. In fact, some kids need very little instruction, but most kids need some and many kids need a lot and some kids need a whole lot. And researchers estimate that maybe like 40%-ish, there's no like firm numbers here, but like maybe about 40% of kids are gonna be able to learn to read pretty well, no matter how you teach them. They just don't need, need that much instruction and they're gonna sort of succeed in spite of the instruction, however you do it. And if they're taught this cueing stuff, they drop those strategies pretty quickly and they begin building that big bank of instantly recognizable words that is so crucial to becoming a skilled reader. But for some kids, they cling to those cueing strategies because those are easier at first, right? And by using these cueing strategies, many, many children can look like good readers until they get to about third or fourth grade when their books begin to have more words and longer words and fewer pictures, and then they're stuck. They haven't developed their phonic skills. Their bank of known words is limited because they haven't been orthographically mapping enough words into their memory that are instantly accessible to them. So reading is slow and laborious and they don't like it, so they don't do it if they don't have to. And while their peers who mastered the basics of decoding early, while they're reading and teaching themselves new words and new information every day through reading, the kids who clung to those cueing strategies, that cueing approach, those kids are falling further and further behind. When children are taught the cueing system, they are being taught to read the way that poor readers read. And that was really the big aha that was shocking to me as a reporter. And I think that is one of the big elephants in the room right now when it comes to reading instruction in the United States. Schools are increasingly checking the phonics box, publishers are checking the phonics box, but they are still teaching cueing. This cueing stuff is still all over the curriculum materials. And I think it's because too many people, too many educators have not been taught how skilled reading develops. They do not know about the scientific research on reading. And when they learn about it, they say things like, this is a quote from a teacher. I felt so angry and guilty when I was finally taught the basics of reading science. I thought, how did you let me teach literacy without knowing this? And I've had so many teachers say things like this to me. The debates about reading is still being fundamentally framed. The debate about reading is still sort of being fundamentally framed as one about phonics, which allows publishers and people who sell professional development services to like add phonics and claim that what they're doing lines up with the science. But if you understand what the research says about how skilled reading develops, you do not teach and you do not sell all those word reading strategies that I was talking about earlier. We have to get away from thinking this is all about phonics, it's not. It's about making sure that children are being taught to read in ways that line up with what decades of scientific research has shown about what skilled reading is and how people learn to do it. It's complex stuff, but it's stuff that teachers want to know more about. I hear from these teachers all the time and they don't have a dog in this fight. They don't have a product that they're selling or a belief system that they need to defend. They want to teach their students how to read. And really, I think those teachers deserve so much more and so much better. They deserve to be taught about the basics of this research and their students deserve it too. Because too many struggling readers do not have parents who can pay for tutors and lawyers and private school if they're not being taught how to read in school. And I know that those children are the children that many of you are concerned about and those are the children that I think about all the time too. So. That's basically what I've learned <laughs> about reading over the past three years. And I think there's a lot that can be done to teach children to read better and especially to give this information to teachers so that they have the knowledge that will really help them teach their students better and help them understand when the materials in front of them are not helping them in that pursuit. Emily, thank you. That's amazing. Um, the amount of um, digging you've done and um, what you've uncovered, I think, to help all of us understand better and, and make it accessible to those of us that are not academics. 
um, what is the science of reading, but also to better understand what's happening um, in our classrooms. Um, I, I'd like to bring in Andy, Andy Rotherham. Um, Andy, um, I know that you have been um, looking at these issues. Um, you, you definitely looked at a lot at um, what's been happening. And um, I, I'm, I'm curious if you could talk to us about um, this gap that Emily is talking about, the gap between what we know about what works for reading and what's actually happening. And I'm curious what your work tells you about the disconnect that exists between what the science says about how to teach children or teach reading and how we're currently teaching reading. And what do you think contributes to that disconnect? And what gets in the way of doing what we, what we know actually works? Yeah, thanks, Monroe, and, and, and thank you all uh, to the campaign uh, for having all of us. And, and thank you to Emily. I mean, that was a great presentation. But I also think uh, what makes Emily really interesting here is she's not the first journalist to sort of come in, take a look at this, and write a story that says, you know, there's an enormous disconnect here between what the preponderance of the evidence shows, what we would call the, the science of reading, but you could also just say the preponderance of, of, of high quality research shows and practice, either practice in terms of what's happening with kids or practice in terms of the training. I think what makes Emily unique, though, that I've seen is um, multimedia and the way she's presenting this, and you got a taste of that, and just her tenacity and staying with it. She didn't sort of parachute in, do this, and then, and then move on to something else. She's, she's stayed with it. Um, and I think in that way, uh, it's, been, it's been impactful. The problem's not obviously is not solved, but she's teed up some important conversations and I think the field owes her a uh, owes her a debt for that um, I mean I think look the, the fundamental thing I wrote a piece for the 74 about this a little while ago I mean a lot of this is I mean some of this is look it's hard to implement anything with fidelity in the American education system it's decentralized I mean you have you know 13,000 school districts and you have charter school networks and every doing their own thing and then that's aggregated up through 50 states plus Washington DC, Puerto Rico, things like that. And so it's just very, um, it, there's just a lot of bottlenecks and it's hard to implement anything. That's an old, that's an old story. That's an old story. Um, and then you lay on that though, a couple other things that are more unique uh, to, to certainly the education to this issue. I think one of them, um, we just still don't have in this field a good culture of evidence um, uh, in terms of respect for, there's lots of different kinds of evidence, but respect for what kinds of evidence you want to generalize uh, from more, and we should be more comfortable uh, making large-scale policy prescriptions. And then second, just an incredible weaponization of, of, of values. And we, we really struggle in this field to disentangle evidence issues from values issues. And taking it out of reading, I think a, a great example of that would be, for example, like Teach for America and the debate about TFA, where you know, the rigorous studies that are using, you know, good methods across multiple places show, you could sort of summarize them by saying, Teacher America teachers are on par with other teachers or modestly better. That would, that, that's sort of a, all the research you can kind of add it up. Um, it's entirely possible for somebody to look at that evidence and go, that's fine, but you know what, I just think this isn't a good way to train teachers. It's not how you build a profession. Um, from a value standpoint, I just have an issue with Teach for America. That's totally legitimate and you can talk about that, but that's not what we do. We weaponize research about Teach for America and there's sort of a raging debate. And I just use that as like one example and you certainly see that in reading um, where values about ideas of learning and so forth. And as Emily said, like none of this is new, um, it, it, this idea and we've argued for centuries about how children learn and so forth. Um, it gets weaponized and we sort of conflate the empiricism with, um, with values in some very unproductive uh, ways. And so that all sort of swirls around this question of just adult politics. And look, schools are political creations. You're always gonna have adult politics. We shouldn't be naive about that. But there are certain issues reading very much amongst them where you really see this um, really take hold and exert some leverage uh, in unproductive ways. And I think that's one reason why we still, you know, according to the, the National Council of Teacher Quality, we've got about half of the um, teacher prep programs in this country teaching like the kind of research that Emily was just presenting. And this has been hailed as sort of great news. And it's certainly an improvement because at the beginning part of the decade, it was, you know, um, uh, the beginning part of the, the teens, it was, you know, about 30%. 
So it's certainly progress, but I don't think, you know, in most places we wouldn't be celebrating, you know, half of, uh, of, of all of our institutions that are tasked with doing something, doing it in a way that's, that's roughly in line with the preponderance of the research. And so, um, but that's like a whole set of adult politics that policymakers are understandably reluctant to take on. The field doesn't make it easy again with this sort of how we respect evidence or don't and, and talk about it. So it's, it's, a, it's a swirling set of adult politics um, that I think make this, make this very challenging, uh, even at the best of times. Yeah, um, we're really not so about evidence here in Charlotte, but um, you know, sometimes it's hard to um, convince uh, people to really take the evidence seriously, particularly for kids that um, need the best supports. Um, you know, since we started planning this webinar um, several months ago, Andy, um, so much has changed. Um, and I, I'm curious, um, what, what do we know about what's happening in terms of equitable access to quality instruction now that most schools are closed in the wake of COVID-19? Yeah, we're, so Bellwether, and I know we're not alone in this across the sector, we're extremely worried about this. And, you know, what's getting a lot of attention and makes for really good media stories is sort of teachers who are doing really heroic things, and there's some of that going on for sure. Um, novel approaches around online and things like that, and everybody is enjoying our sort of national adventure and all being homeschoolers for a little bit. Um, but we're really worried that that is obscuring a whole set of issues, particularly for kids who are more at the margins of the system. Those are kids who, they don't have online access either because of device issues, broadband issues, both. Uh, they uh, were sent home with nothing or they were sent home with very insufficient packets. And sort of as Emily was talking about, this sequential need to both build knowledge and, and teach reading uh, there's a lot of kids who may not get any of that for six months. They're the kids who disproportionately are going to be able to least afford it. And we're not talking, this is not a, a marginal problem. Like if you start to look at the numbers and you look at, so, you know, the Ed Trust just did a, a set of surveys in California. Um, I mean, we're, this, could, this could easily be uh, 10 million kids or more um, who are simply disconnected uh, from learning at pivotal points uh, in their uh, in their education, and if you look at the the evidence that um, Chris Minich of uh, NWEA put out the other day, like uh, it, this is even going to be more of a, a pronounced effect on kids uh, earlier uh, in their education. So, you know, kids uh, K three when we're really focusing on these literacy things, and so this was a problem before, and sort of the lack of um, the lack of fidelity and everything Emily is talking about, and then. Just in the time, as you said, Monroe, from when we decided, like, let's do a webinar about this till now, like the bottom has sort of fallen out. And now it is just an incredibly acute and immediate problem. Uh, and the field needs to step up and take some really concrete steps, not just to sort of in this idea of let's not let a crisis go to waste and build like great online stuff. I mean, that that's fine. But we, we need an and with that. And that and is like, how do we very immediately and in very pragmatic ways get material to kids so they can continue to learn. And I think like one place that we've seen, um, you know, in New York, Eva Moskowitz with Success Academies, I mean, she's basically solving this problem with like 1950s technology. They're using telephones to make sure that they're reaching kids, people have what, uh, you know, reaching families and kids, people have what they need, getting those materials out there. And I think that's kind of the, the sort of spirit, uh, the sort of spirit that we need here. It's not necessarily this great new 21st century thing. It's just how, in, uh, in, in the lowest tech way possible, respecting social distancing, can you make sure families have what they need or the learning losses that we see anyway as a result of this are gonna be compounded for the kids who can least afford it. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I think it's definitely a call to arms. Um, there were these disparities and inequities that we all have been you know, fighting against for a long time and it, this is just magnified and amplified them. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm personally really worried about the negative ripple effects that are just going to just going to last for you know a generation unless we all come together and fight against um, COVID and realize that um, fighting for early literacy is going to be an important part of the recovery after we get through COVID nineteen. Um, well, thanks, thanks, Andy, and uh, look forward to having you uh, having your thoughts in the Q and A. Um, I want to um, turn to uh, Jenny McKenzie. 
And um, Jenny, we're excited to um, talk with you. You've had a chance to hear um, Emily and, and Andy's comments, but before um, we talk with you, I'd like to um, share with everyone, we we're excited to share a uh, special trailer um, on the new uh, documentary that you're working on. Every child must start school ready to learn. If a child doesn't pass the third grade reading test, they're more likely to go to prison, more likely to be to pregnancy. Basically, saying there'll be failure. I'm not raising my child to be anyone's failure. No puede estudiar. No porque no haya querido. Sino porque yo no tuve la oportunidad. Nuestra prioridad es que ellos estudien. In 2012, Virginia Beach had about a quarter of our children starting kindergarten behind. And what we know, once they start behind, they stay behind. Elementary school, they would ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? Every time I did a teacher. Now, I want to be a teacher. So this is a passion in me to help you understand that we do have the power. It don't start at kindergarten. It starts right now. I would love to do everything I can, start with education as early as I can, and make sure that we start on the right track, because the way to stay on track is to start on track. One of the things we look at when children transition from Head Start to public school, they do a kindergarten readiness assessment. And what the data was showing is that the greatest gap was in language and literacy. Like, oh, intervene at third grade, right? Reading by third grade. That's too late. We can actually teach all kids to read pretty well by the end of third grade. We can actually prevent so many other problems. We should succeed in seeing that every eight-year-old can read independently. We need to prepare our children to read and succeed in school. Early education is a win for everybody. We're losing generation after generation while waiting for this perfect system to emerge. In 35 years, we've gone backwards, not forwards. Not only is this a complete tragedy for those kids, this is a tragedy for our country. Our nation's report card shows that two-thirds of American students can't read at grade level. Two out of three are what the report card calls below basic readers. But let's be honest about what below basic really is. They can't read. It's kind of amazing if you look at the, just the basic data, like why aren't we screaming and yelling about this? If you know how to read, you can vote. You can do a lot of things if you know how to read. Antes de ese programa, ellos no sabían los números, no sabían leer, no sabían nada. I like reading because then I get smart. I first heard about the program in November when the teachers had this reading program for early literacy, for kindergarten reading. Years. The number of people who've contracted the coronavirus continues to grow. Tennessee is the first case of COVID-19 in Virginia. All public and private schools will remain closed. School is also shut all over the country. That means 32 and a half million students are affected. Hello, everyone. I just want to give you a quick update. I'm trying to stay within what his teacher is teaching him, or was teaching him before school was abruptly, you know, stopped. Just trying to hold everything together. I have me here for my family. Jenny, that looks great. Um, I am excited to look to see it. Um, when, when's it going to be out? Well, COVID has actually put a cramp into our production schedule because we had four production trips that were scheduled over the next four months that we've had to cancel. So as you can see from the end of the trailer, 
we have our families doing some self filming and then putting clips up on Google Drive. And really so much of what Andy said, which is families who are really in a situation where these kids um, are on the margins and there's so much that's challenging in their lives. It's, it's tough. Some of them don't have good internet access. But if all goes well, we would love for the film to be out in 2021. Okay. So it'll screen at festivals. Then we hope it would air on a PBS or an HBO or a Hulu. And our real goal for social impact films is not just to have good distribution to get it into festivals, but really to get this kind of a documentary into communities to create conversation around the inequities and around the disparity gaps that exist so that we can talk about access to early language acquisition programs, pre-literacy programs that are, as Emily and Andy have talked about, grounded in reading science so that access to these programs can potentially help to address and close some of those disparity gaps. So, um, Jenny, I know that um, everyone in the campaign knows that these disparities, disparities do not begin in kindergarten, um, that the gaps certainly appear earlier. You know, reflecting on, you know, what Emily and Andy talked to us about the inequities, um, I'm curious what you uncovered and what, what you've learned about um, these inequities and in access to early language development, pre-literacy skills before kids even start school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for us, there have been many ahas through the production process. And I'm so grateful for Emily's incredible investigative journalism and love what Andy said about her tenacity and sticking with, with it. But I think for me, one of the first big ones is we have six or seven presidents from both sides of the aisle who've been addressing this issue, creating uh, initiatives, spending billions of dollars, trying to turn around our failing reading scores. But we really aren't focusing on setting up kids for success early and allowing them to be prepared to become skilled readers. So that really means looking at some of the basics that may not sort of come as basic knowledge to parents, which is really looking at early language acquisition. And language, of course, precedes literacy or that piece of reading and writing. So it's the first form of communication that comes. And if early language isn't paramount in a kid's life, if they aren't speaking their language on a regular basis, increasing their vocabulary, having conversations, learning sentence structure, having that back and forth that happens in families, they aren't going to be set up for really then understanding their written language and being able to write that language that they've learned to speak. So early language acquisition is kind of the foundation for all of it. And also pre-literacy programs. So programs that really are grounded in the basics of understanding the alphabet, learning phonics, and then being able to decode and do those things well so that kids start kindergarten prepared to become a skilled reader. Well, I'm glad that you and your work are lifting up the importance of early language acquisition, emergent literacy skill development. Um, I often tell people that um, your uh, child's language um, comprehension sets the bar for their reading comprehension because as they're going through school, their, their, their reading comprehension is catching up with their language comprehension, which should be way ahead of it, of, uh, of their reading comprehension when they're younger. And for children that have, don't have enough language, right, and vocabulary and, and uh, language comprehension, that just really creates even more challenges when they're trying to learn to read. Absolutely. And also, I will put it into the chat, a link to the trailer, because I know streaming it sometimes for people may have been a little challenging with uh, buffering and internet and stuff. So I'll put a link in case anyone wants to rewatch the trailer and uh, see it directly from 
their own home offices. Well, Jenny, I can tell you already, we would love to have you in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, when you're ready. And uh, I, I know we've got a number of people from Charlotte that are uh, on this webinar. And so know you've got an open invitation and we look forward to having you come and, and screening the documentary. Great, we will plan on it. Thank you, Monroe. Right. Thank you, Jenny. All right, um, well, I know we've got, um, we've had a lot of questions that have come in. And, um, uh, um, and so what I'm gonna try to do, I think Sarah and I are gonna try to uh, um, do our best to try to get to as many questions as we can over the next 25 minutes or so. So um, uh, please um, you know, continue to put your questions in the uh, Q&A, but um, we're gonna uh, do our best here. So um, uh, first off, um, We've gotten a number of questions about programs, publishers, uh, methods. Um, uh, folks are looking for names of, uh, of sources that are doing things right, evidence-based programs that are partnering with schools, et cetera. Emily, I'm curious whether um, in the reporting you've done and the writing you've done, whether um, you've got any recommendations for where to point people to know um, what, is, um, what works, what, 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 should, what could they use? to try to put into practice um, the, the research on the science of reading. It looks like Emily is muted. Okay, now I'm here, right? Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, do you want my video too? Okay. It would be lovely to see. You. Okay, here I am with needing a haircut like everyone else in America, right? Oh, unable to start my video. I think maybe you guys have control of my video on your end. Anyway. Um, that's always a tricky question for anyone, and especially for a journalist, uh, because it is really not my, um, you know, uh, I think it's very hard for me to recommend particular programs. And I think, it, I think it's actually really important for people to recognize that I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect program out there. And I don't think the solution really is a program. Um, I think that teachers do need better materials. And there are people out there who I think are trying very hard to make some better materials. Um, but I do think that it's real. And, and I actually, so I think there's sort of two things go on. I think teachers learn things from their materials and from each other. Um, and the, the really important thing is to make sure that teachers do get a good grounding in what the scientific research says. Not every teacher needs to be an expert in all of the thousands of studies that have been done on reading. But I think sometimes even if, if, if a, a, a well-meaning school leader or district leader goes in with a new set of materials that might be more grounded in the science of reading, but it, it is not accompanied by really good basic sort of understanding of the why of it, I don't know if that is really going to get people where they want to be. Because like I said, there's not a perfect program. And it really, a lot of this stuff, just teachers need to have this knowledge so that they can see when things are or aren't working. They understand the why. Um, so, I mean, I think it's sort of about both. Because at the same, you know, another thing happens, I think, which is that teachers do learn about the scientific research. And then they say, but I have not, I don't have good materials to use. The materials that I use are telling me to do like the opposite thing. So that's a problem too. And the assessments that I have are either not giving me the information that I really need about what's going on, or they're actually asking me to sort of rate kids on things that aren't very meaningful or that are like sort of misleading me into, into sort of what is actually going on with all of the pieces that need to come together to sort of multiply up to skilled reading. Um, so there may be other people here on the panel who are, can better able like name names and things that are good. Um, you know, I, I will say this, I think that the gap between research and practice is so vast that some of even the tools we've used to tell us whether our curriculum does line up with the science maybe doesn't really tell us that. <laughs> you know, like we, we've, people have done various kinds of reviews to look at how it lines up against certain things, the common core standards, for example, but whether or not you, if you go really into like what's happening in early reading instruction and whether that really lines up with what we've learned about like the development of skilled reading, I think it's an open question. I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area, in the area of, of curriculum 
materials that are available to teachers. But again, I would caution anyone against thinking that curriculum is somehow going to be the answer. It's a part of the answer, but I don't think it's the answer. So um, follow-up question for you, Emily, is um, a couple of folks have asked, okay, so um, get it that, that you're saying there's no perfect program and um, there are folks that are sharing on the chat various sources, What Works Clearinghouse, Florida Center for Reading Research. Um, but I'm curious about the how. Um, and as you've looked at this over the last three years, do you have any thoughts about um, if there are good models for engaging teachers in a conversation about how to put this research and knowledge into practice in a way, and, and particularly thinking about context, right? The supportive of their context and their capacity. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, I do know that what I've learned from my reporting is that there are a number of things that go on out there. Like I have heard from an extraordinary number of teachers who have actually, I have a few quotes from them. So like, this is the, the real deal for some teachers out there. They've been saying things to me like, they, when they do understand this research and they try to do something about it, they can often really be, um, get in trouble, <laughs> be dinged, um, have a really hard time. Like their colleagues don't know this stuff or don't believe in it or don't wanna hear about it. Um, I mean, so they say, the teachers say things to me like, I've, um, I've been fighting the reading wars in my school district. I've been demoted, demoralized, and silenced. This is what someone said. I go to work each day in fear of further retaliation from my school district. So I think there's, from the reporting that I have done, it seems to me that a lot of pieces have to come together at the same time. There needs to be a real investment in the teacher development part of this with like, bringing in knowledgeable people who really understand the scientific research and how it applies to teaching. Because I think a really important part of this is there, the, va the, the evidence on reading and how it develops is vast. That doesn't mean sort of how to teach it is as vast. <laughs> like they're translating the research into practice is not as clear. For example, there's a lot of good discussion to have about phonics and how it gets taught a lot of different phonics programs. Some of those phonics programs may have some really good parts to them. They may be based on some ideas that are a little out of date uh, in terms of what we really know about skilled reading and, and development. That it, you know, teaching kids phonics without really developing their like phonemic awareness and their ability to really like discern the sounds and words isn't gonna do a lot of good. So there's, there's, there's some really important conversations to have about phonics and you know, at the end of the day, I think one of the reasons that we fought so much about this in the United States of America and all over the English speaking world, there are wars about reading, is because English is actually a complex language to learn. And it takes even just a typically developing reader who's taught pretty well, it'll take a few years to develop the basics of written English. Uh, we have like a deep orthography, there's a lot to learn. And, and learning some basic sort of phonics gets you far in English, but it doesn't get you all the way there's a lot more to understand about um, sort of the meanings of words and the history of words and where our spelling patterns come from. And, you know, in some other languages where the, uh, it's the, the relationship between sounds and letters is much more standard, uh, Spanish, Italian, you know, it takes a typically developing reader like a few months to learn the basics of their written language. But we fight about it in the United States because there's a lot to think about when you want to teach a kid written English. That's a hard thing to do. Um, so anyway, so I, just to finish that thought, I think it's not only about uh, helping, from what I've heard from people in my reporting, a really key element of this is the administrators too, like making sure like the principals and even like the reading coaches and the reading specialists, because unfortunately not all of them have actually learned about the scientific research in their development. And so like you have to have, you can't just teach the teachers because then like the people above me don't believe in this or don't have a fire to change it or speak out against me. And you can't just do it from the top either, because if you just sort of impose this stuff on teachers, that doesn't make sense to them. They need, they need to be given the why. And the thing that's encouraging to me as a reporter is that when teachers do get the why, when they do get the basics of this, almost uniformly the response is like, oh my gosh, like, wow, that's, I didn't know that. And that's fascinating. And that makes so much sense. And when they start to use it in their classrooms, they see kids respond. They see that the, the kids that they weren't reaching before, many of those kids, maybe not all of them, but many of those kids really start to respond very differently and they start to turn into readers and it's really exciting for teachers. That's what they tell me. 
Well, thanks, Emily. Speaking of teachers, Andy, I want to pull you in here. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, we're getting a few questions here about higher ed and uh, teacher prep, and I'm curious what your thoughts are about what's the role and responsibility of higher ed teacher prep credentialing programs um, with uh, um, the, this topic we've got here today around reading instruction, science of reading. Um, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, you've got a couple of things going on. One, I mean, you want to make sure you do respect uh, teacher prep programs, ed school professors, our academics, uh, uh, in the same way as any other um, any other schools. You want to make sure you're respecting academic freedom and people's ability to uh, argue in terms of their, their range of expertise for what they think is right and so forth. That's important. At the same time, there's a throughput of these uh, institutions, this training, uh, this training teachers is credentialed by the state, often enjoys in most states a fairly privileged position to do that, that's insulated from competition. Um, and it's not unreasonable for the state to take a look at what the preponderance of evidence is around a question and require that those elements are in place um, and take some of what we might consider somewhat coercive steps towards making sure that people who are coming out um, know this. Emily has been talking about how frustrating it is um, uh, for teachers and when they sort of experience this. And I think, you know, and I, I teach, um, I've been involved with ed schools most of my career as a student, as a uh, uh, teaching and on the oversight boards for a couple of them. Um, it's also frustrating for teachers um, who, when they're given sort of one view of the world and then they emerge into a professional system that operates differently, that can be very jarring. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of work that we could do there uh, for better alignment. Uh, and the accrediting bodies uh, need to also make sure this is a priority. But most importantly, there's absolutely no substitute for deans stepping up and exerting leadership uh, on this question. And I think part of the problem has traditionally been just given all the politics that is a thankless, uh, a thankless, often non-rewarding task, and in some cases, not a great way to continue being a dean. And we need to uh, we need to change the culture around that. Um, I mean, there's some efforts to do that. Obviously, like deans for impact and so forth is trying to. To, to change that, but there's a lot of work to be done there. And I think there's a, you know, we've, we've got um, an ecosystem of political leaders, accrediting bodies, national leaders, and these schools, and everybody needs to do their part to make the world a little bit safer for Mavericks who are trying, um, who, are trying to, who are trying to push on this. And I do think you can balance the science uh, and what the preponderance of evidence points to while also respecting and preserving uh, academic freedom. You know, I, um, I think, um, you know, Andy, you, you brought up uh, leaders at higher ed. Emily, you've mentioned leaders in, um, in, in schools. It feels like um, part of the challenge here is to figure out how do you engage the leadership um, that's creating the culture and environment. Um, we've had some questions about what do you say, um, you know, to teachers that, you know, want to try some of this stuff but doesn't have a supportive environment. The other side is what do you say to teachers that have been teaching for a long time and you know, not really interested in hearing doing anything different. What's the role of um, what's the role of leaders in creating that space and culture for this conversation for changes to happen? And um, do you have any um, examples or models where um, you know leaders have played an important role of creating that space for teachers to look at how they can shift their instructional practices? I mean, I think it's really important to. What I've heard from teachers who learned kind of one view of the world, as Andy said, in their teacher prep or in the professional development they got or earlier in their career, and have had their eyes opened through either some kind of really good professional development experience or something that they've done sort of on their own, like going to a conference or discovering this research on their own, or as happens with many teachers, they themselves had a child who was struggling with reading, and that was their entree into understanding this. What I've heard from so many of them is, you know, like you can't begin by telling teachers they're doing something wrong, for example. Like the way to begin is to show teachers that there is this huge body of evidence and what it says. It says some, you know, start with a simple view of reading. There are some other really basic sort of models out there of what skilled reading is that you can sort of introduce to teachers. And like uniformly, they all go, 
aha, like they have huge aha moments when you start to show them that stuff. And then they start to question, why am I teaching that this way? Why am I using this assessment? Why am I using this leveled book system? Why am I using these word reading strategies? Have that sort of, it falls away on its own when you replace it with something else. So you start with the replacement and let the teachers understand the implications of all that. As one teacher said to me specifically with the whole queuing thing, she said, you can't just start with like telling teachers that there's something wrong with this queuing thing because it's so actually fundamental, even if they don't know it by that name, to the stuff that they've learned about what reading is, that if you just start there, it's like running into a church and yelling, there's no God. And you can't do it that way. Um, but people themselves will start to fall away and become the, you know, question their own belief system if you show them this scientific research. And, you know, the researchers haven't always made it easily easy to access and access. And like I said before, it's not like it's so clear how to translate all of this stuff into actual teaching. That is not as clear. And so it's, it's fair game. There's, there's plenty of stuff to talk about there. But the fact that teachers haven't been given the basics of what the scientists have discovered, I really think it creates a lot of change when you just have teachers learn the basics of that because then they start asking their own questions. And that's the best way for like lasting deep and meaningful change. I think Monroe, two other sort of dimensions on this. One is teachers don't get uh, in preparation programs a lot of exposure to evidence, how to think about evidence, sort of professional learning, um, sort of, and, and it, it, no one, and Dan Willingham uh, uh, of UVA, and I have a piece coming out uh, soon in ASCD that talks about this. No one's saying that like we need to turn teachers into, into methodologists, but teachers and then to a larger extent administrators and so forth should get some basic understanding of how to think about evidence, uh, how to think about the how sort of evidence continues to evolve and how you learn from that, what you want to generalize from, and very few programs give any exposure to that. And so uh, it's not surprising that teachers, that teachers are frustrated. And then the second thing, and this picks up on, on what Emily just said, I'd be very leery to present this as any sort of generational issue that older teachers don't want to learn, younger teachers are more open, so forth. I think um, people have a learner mindset or they don't, and I don't know that that correlates uh, with, with age or, or generation. I think it correlates with uh, personal characteristics, ways you've been trained, induction, uh, how you've been sort of how you've gone through an institution. Um, and I think we, you find a lot of teachers, um, uh, and so the ways into the conversation, like what, what Emily was saying, I think it, it, it's, it's more whether you're talking to long-term veterans or newer teachers, sort of good ways in, how to make this real and so forth. But I think if we, if we think of this as only a generational issue, we're missing the role of prep and we're also missing the role. There's a lot of teachers out there in the system right now who are allies or want to be allies um, and, and that we can uh, we can activate, and it has nothing to do with with tenure. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Jenny, I, I'd I'd love to um, get you in in here. Um, we've got some question about parents, and um, particularly in the early years. Um, you know, I we know that parents are are hungry for this information. They're often asking, "What can I do to help support my children?" Um, particularly curious about what you have learned about. Um, uh, parents and the work you've done and um, what how it is that we could provide better supports for for parents to particularly in the early years to help them know what are the right skills to build for their kids wish I had a magic wand for for that one but I think you know the most critical thing that parents often don't know is talk to your kids talk to your kids talk to them a lot and I think the more challenges that families are faced with, they, that is going to put them sort of at higher risk for early language acquisition. I mean, you think of kids who are in dual language learning families who really haven't been exposed to the English language earlier. You think about families who are really facing big challenges with poverty. But talking to your kids is something that really sets them up for the greatest success in literacy. 
And um, I've loved listening to Andy and Emily. And I think one of the things that we've learned in diving into our research and also looking at the politics that's connected here is really the politics that also is involved in higher ed. Because anyone who's coming out of Columbia's Teachers College is really getting a fairly clear, I think, curriculum exposure to the work that Lucy Calkins has done. I mean, I may be wrong, but this is, I think, some of the stuff that we are also seeing. So to me, it's pushing that early language and then creating access for those kids to push forward with um, pre-literacy access. So, you know, I know one of the things that the campaign's really focused on is parents. And um, I believe that's going to be a big uh, theme of the upcoming GLR week in July. Um, you know, to all of our panelists, I'm curious about building on this, this question. Um, how do we think about parent voice? And how do we help parents have a real voice so they can ask, you know, really kind of the right questions of uh, teachers, whether it's or, you know, or, um, in preschool, pre-K, whether it's in K-3, um, with a real understanding of where their children should be and what they should be learning. Any thoughts? I think for, from our perspective in the film and following the four families that we've been following for two years, one of the families that we've been following in Virginia Beach actually uh, is a parent who went through an early language program called Lena and now she's become a trainer. And what she shares in the uh, trailer is that parents have the power. So it's really about connecting, I think, to parents early on and them feeling confident so that they can continue to advocate for their kids as their kids launch their elementary schools, school years um, successfully, because I think parents feel intimidated. They feel as though it's not truly a partnership. And I think particularly for the, some of the families that we've been following when there are other vulnerabilities, they feel as though the teachers are the experts, the administration is the experts, and I really don't have um, say in here. And it, it needs to be a collaborative partnership. Yeah, I, well, I was just going to say, I mean, I, actually, my own experience as a parent, I did not have struggling readers, but I got a little bit of a taste of what I think the parents of struggling readers get, like, in, you know, exponentially, which is just being sort of inundated with this kind of language and stuff that they can't understand. You know, they go on with a very basic question, like, my kid seems not interested in reading, he's struggling doing it you know, she's having a really hard time and they just, they're showing all these different assessments and they're given all these different things and it's just not that said in plain language. And I guess as a reporter and particularly as a person who makes like audio broadcasts, you know, that's a big thing for me is like, sort of like, let's like, if you can't just say it in plain language, like, what are you talking about? And I, I feel like parents need to feel more powerful. Like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Like, let's just talk in plain English here. And I think some of the gobbledygook that's in education is sort of, mask or it's just sort of filling in on top of the fact that maybe a lot of people don't really know because you know even though I said that the scientific research is a lot of it and it's complex actually when you start to dig into it it's not that complex there's some very like basic ideas and sort of sort of like basic things and when when kids are struggling to read the words on the page when they're in second grade something's going on and something needs to be done um, and so I think parents really need to just sort of it's a hard thing to do, but need to speak up and be like, wait a minute, like, let, let's just go to the beginning here. Like, I, 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 need, I need you to disentangle all this stuff. And I think that, you know, a lot of what's causing the change around reading in this country is because parents have gotten very powerful, particularly the parents of kids who are especially struggling, kids with dyslexia. But if you look at that movement, it is a movement that is largely driven by relatively affluent almost entirely white, mostly mothers in some of our quote unquote best schools in America. And these people are saying like, my kid's not learning how to read in these really good schools. And so we've got a problem, but it's time for us to understand two things. 
when those kids, you know, when they're not learning to read, think of all the other kids that aren't learning to read. And one of the big takeaways from the reading science is it's not like everyone learns how to read in some different way. It's not like kids who have dyslexia, quote unquote, need some other entirely different kind of instruction than everyone else. We all need to learn the same basic things to turn our non-reading baby brains into reading brains. Some kids need a lot more repetition, a lot more help, a lot more explicit instruction. But everyone, like skilled reading is more similar brain to brain than not. And so we need to think of it that way. The, the kids who are really struggling with reading, they're like the canaries in the coal mine, showing us like something bigger is wrong here. And there's a whole bunch of kids out there who are kind of squeaking by and looking like they're doing okay. And a lot of them aren't doing that okay. And then there are some kids who are gonna do great in spite of the instruction because their brains take to it really easily or because their mom and dad is paying for tutoring or do it, you know, or, or has it, or is teaching them themselves. And many parents teach their kids themselves. They, they really do. And in fact, one piece of advice I got, it's a terrible piece of advice to give, but you know, what do you, what do you do if there's really some of this, some of these sort of flawed ways of teaching reading? And actually one of the things is teach your kid to read before they go to school. <laughs> and many kids can learn to read pretty well when they're five years old and there's a lot you can do at home. And if you wanna take that upon yourself, I think that many parents have been successful. Now, some kids really have learning issues and I don't know that a parent's really gonna be able to do that. But, and that's a big thing to ask to say, to teach your kid to read, but many parents have decided, I'll just teach my, own, my child to read and they do that. All right. I think Emily's, yeah, I think that's right about the sort of, you know, the, the language can be confusing for parents, balanced. I mean, who doesn't want something balanced for their kids, a balanced literacy, those words. And, and parents do, all of us think our children are, are unicorns. And so this is why ideas like learning styles and so forth, it takes hold this idea that every child's different and so forth. This is all very intuitive for parents, even if there's like a lot of science that, that says that it's, it's not necessarily the case. But I was surprised no one, and Emily, I think you've been following this, what happened in Oakland where parents sort of organized. There was a, a group there that was a, a parent group, I think it was called Oakland Reach, and they work yep. with the NAACP and they said enough's enough and got some, some changes to board policy. You've been following that, right? Uh, yes, and uh, there are, and there are some examples of some really powerful parent groups that are making change and they have made some big changes. We'll see what happens. It's all, the devil's always in the details, right? But there is a parent group working with the NAACP in Oakland. It's called Oakland Reach. And they have really gotten some change at the school board, school district level um, in terms of how reading is going to be taught there. I think we have some people who work in that district who are on this um, webinar. Yeah, so I think that just shows parents can, you know, we, we talk about parents often like individually and what are they going to do, but also aggregated can exert some real leverage around this. And, and that group did a, you know, it, what seems like a good job in educating people on uh, the evidence base, the stakes, and in ways that, that made it intuitive to the average parent and, and, and got them engaged in the fight. Yep. Oh, thank you. Well, um, we've just uh, put up a short survey poll. We hope that everyone will... Um, uh, you know, fill it out. It's really important um, for all of us and for the campaign to get your feedback about um, how we did in this webinar and, and uh, which allows us to make these even better in the future. Um, so, um, Sarah, um, are you on? I am on. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, great. Thank you. Um, before we close, I did just want to flag the poll that Monroe just mentioned and um, let you know that if you haven't had a chance to complete uh, that, you share your thoughts in that survey poll, please do so. It'll stay open until we close the webinar in just a few minutes. In addition, I really want to say a heartfelt thank you so much to our amazing presentation team for joining us today. I think that the abundance of questions that were posted and the many comments in the chat box show that um, their presentation was right on and really valuable to um, those of you who were able to join in. So thank you to Emily Hanford, to Andy Rotherham, and to Jenny McKenzie for sharing your work and your insights with us and with our network today. And thank you to Monroe Richardson for moderating today's conversation and for pushing us to lift up this really important topic. It's a topic that's too large and influential to be covered in just one GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar. So I'd ask you to please save the date um, and make plans to join us on Tuesday, May 19th for, for part two of today's webinar, Lifting Up the Science of Reading. Um, also, I saw a number of questions that came in the Q&A box that we weren't able to get into asking about dyslexia. 
and uh, wanted to just let everyone know that we are planning a uh, webinar on May 5th that uh, looking at a gamified screener and app that can help identify children with learning differences, including dyslexia in the preschool years. That will be on May 5th, I said, with the Tremaine Foundation and Boston's Children's, Boston Children's Hospital. So if you're interested in that, I hope you can join us for that. And then also a quick reminder um, that we have two GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars coming up next week. Um, the first one highlighting the federal relief packages that were passed recently by Congress and how they can be leveraged to support families and children with a start time at 12.30. And I also saw a Q&A, question, a question that came in the Q&A box about support for schools post COVID. So I'd encourage that person to join in for that conversation next Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. And then all after that, we will have a session exploring how behavior science can be employed to engage and support families both while schools are closed and when they reopen. Um, thank you all so much for joining in for today's conversation. I hope that you will be well and be able to join us for, next, for future GLR Learning Tuesdays webinars. Thank you again to our wonderful presentation team um, and for everyone for joining in. Bye-bye.